Many photographers are self-taught and others go to a school for photography. This week we're going to take you to Brooks Institute in the incredible city of Santa Barbara where this photographer is a professor, a published writer of many books, an inspirational teacher and played a very pivotal role in the amazing final product that many of us use, Adobe Photoshop. Heck, celebrities even ask this guy to teach them Photoshop. Come on. in Santa Barbara, California, and we are here with the Chris Orwig. You might know him as the Photoshop guru, the master of all Photoshop, master of all photography, Mr. Inspiration himself, but I want you guys to know this guy. He's pretty cool. He's a professor here at Brooks, and he's gonna give us a little tour of Brooks Institute, right? Yep. Let's head in and check it out. So one of the things that's cool about Brooks is there are different campuses that focus on different things. This particular one really focuses on the digital side of photography as well as there's some gallery space. And so we're gonna walk through some of that space. It looks like there's a little event happening here, but we'll just walk around that. And what's fun is we have these exhibits from all sorts of photographers. We'll walk down here to see some photographs from students at Brooks that are graduating right now. and. If we uh, just kind of look down the hallway, you'll see there's a range of pictures. Um, students that photograph food or people or action sports or, you know, really who knows what. And that's one of the things that makes Brooks kind of fun is that it's really diverse. And we have students from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of walks of life, and they shoot lots of different things. We'll look at the other side of the gallery over here just to kind of walk through and see what we have. And as a teacher, what's kind of fun is to see students when they really get it. Um, typically, people start off with passion. That turns into learning a few technical skills. And then eventually, they transcend technical and they get to style and, and, and saying something that matters and is visual and intriguing and engaging. And again, you can just see kind of what it happens to be here. Um, like, say, with this shot, I think it's trying to take something that's kind of normal, but get a different angle and perspective and say something new with it. And that's really kind of what the goal is, is to find your voice. And so that's part of this campus is celebrating that. And another part is uh, upstairs some digital labs. So let's head up there, and check those out. So one of the interesting things about teaching, of course, is trying to figure out how to get people that place where they have vision and voice. And this is where a lot of that fun happens. And I like what Ewan McGregor um, talks about when he reflects on acting school. He said that acting school was a place where you could make mistakes and not lose your job. Because once you're working, if you make a mistake, everyone knows it, everyone sees it, you may not get another film, at least in acting. I think photography is kind of the same way. You have to take these risks constantly. And if you flop and people kind of see that, you may not get to work with that client again. But photo school is that sacred kind of space where you get to make big, bold mistakes. And so what that means here in regards to the digital stuff is playing with Photoshop. And sometimes it means going back to those early days with Photoshop when you're just kind of tinkering and you're experimenting. And there's no right answer. And at the same time, it means developing these incredibly precise technical skills that make you super efficient and fast, lean and mean. And so it's balancing those two things, all with the goal of creating better photographs, all really with the goal of making your work invisible. And the best Photoshop work is just that, no one notices it. 
And that's really the challenge. And that's what the challenge is. Every time I step in this classroom, how can I help this group of students get good enough at this tool, have enough fun with it, get technically proficient, so that when someone sees their photograph, they think about the image. They don't think about the post-production. They don't think about the camera. They don't think about any of those things. And so, anyway, that's kind of the goal. And, and for me, the whole teaching thing is, is how, do you, how do you get people passionate about that? How do you get them behind that idea? It's, it's exciting to see people discover things, and I learn a ton through all that they discover, and we learn from each other. So anyway, this is kind of a fun spot to be, and it's great to share that with you guys. We are at the office of CO, Chris Orwig, here. And I just want to ask you, who, who are these people out here? Like, who's yeah. this good-looking, handsome, scruffy, rugged fella? Yeah, this guy is a professional surfer named Rob Machado. Fascinating person. You can see kind of the life in his eyes. Yeah. And he, he lives and surfs with a lot of vitality. And right. this was a fun picture of him. And then the other thing is uh, a book I did called Visual Poetry, another surfer on the cover named Joe Curran. Um, so these are all pro surfers? A lot of them, but then in the book there's my daughters or travel or all different kinds of photography. But so I why, do, did, why did you do this book? Yeah, um, the book was about trying to provide some inspiration and kind of this whole idea of um, that poetry is a reduction and a simplification and that you can say more with less, but poems, you're not just reducing and simplifying, you're reducing, simplifying, and deepening. So it's that extra little uh -huh. kind of thing. And so that's the idea of the book, is to figure out how that connects with photography and how to inspire people to try to create pictures that um, have that little extra element. And all of these photos are yours? Yeah, and there, a lot, I should say, most of them are mine. And then each chapter I have a guest speaker these photographers that I've interviewed and asked the same questions. People I've talked to, <laughs> um, one meaningful re review or email I got from someone was that there was a woman who wrote me and said, um, my husband has been terminally ill and I've been caring for him for the last few years. Um, since that's happened, I haven't taken a single picture because I've been so consumed with that. He, he's since passed away and someone gave me your book and I, I read it and it was enough for me to set my camera out, get it out of its bag and put it on the coffee table. And she said, I haven't taken a picture yet, but it's, I'm, got, I'm getting closer to that, and thank you. And so the reason I say that is I think, I mean, that's a really wonderful, obviously, sure. email, but the, the idea of it is I think is for someone who says, okay, either I'm a little burned out right. or a lot burned out in that mm -hmm. situation, and I'm looking for something to reignite my passion for the art and craft of photography. I'm not so much interested in a little niche of fine art or a little niche of people photography. It's more like the passion for it. Right. Um, and that, that I would think that's kind of what, what it is. Um, and, so and it's, it's igniting my... igniting people's, so it's basically a, a good inspiration. Yeah, I maybe mean, that's the hope. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, let's take it here Okay, let's head in. So this is my office, Yeah. and one of the things that one of my mentors told me early on is you have to create a space, it's like a greenhouse for creativity, so you walk into it and you're like, yeah, I'm inspired. Cool. So, um, so just looking around here at your work, I mean, behind you, what, what are we looking at? Yeah, th these are two pictures by Rodney Smith, and he's someone who inspires me in huge ways, and one time, and I've said this before, but one time at lunch, he said this offhand comment that was stillness of hand can't make up for emptiness of heart. In other words, technique or holding a camera still isn't enough. Uh -huh. You have to have some kind of heart or soul or depth. And his pictures right. have that. He asks questions with his photos. So, and, and those are the best pictures. The one that tell you enough, not too much. And they leave, they leave space for your imagination or for inquiry. They bring you back the ones that kind of tell you everything you like at first, but then you're like, oh, Mm -hmm. That's kind of all there is. So right. those are fun for me. I, I've lived with those pictures and they've, they've kind of gotten under my skin and it's fun to see students' reaction to them. Really? Yeah, some students are kind of threatened by them because uh -huh. they're so simple. One, one guy came in and said, I could do that. And I was like, yeah, but you didn't. You know? <laughs> that's that's kind of the thing with photography is, you know, once you see the shot, you're like, well, yeah, I could do that. But the trick is to go out and do it. That's and right. Make it happen. 
one of the things I found, and probably why a lot of this stuff is here, is I've you know, been teaching here 10 years, and I've seen a lot of students go on and make it, and a lot of them not. What? The ones that don't make it, that say, hey, I'm burned out, I'm done. I never want to touch a camera again. I've had those. Yeah. I always say, what happened? They don't know. And then I kind of get into it. I said, well, what do you do? With, you know, what do you do while you're here at, at this photography school? While you're studying this? And so, well, photography stuff, photography stuff, and more photography stuff. And they kind of hang their head. They're beaten. And then I say, well, what do you do before Brooks? And they light up. And they're like, I was in a yoga or horseback riding, or I played professional baseball, or who knows what. You know, something right. really, really neat. And then, and then when they came, they just did one thing. And what I found is that photography is amazing, but the trick isn't just doing photography. It's it's having a lot of passions and interests and bringing those into photography. It's kind of this both and. And so, in a sense, my office, you know, is, is I think part of that reflection for me that um, you know that the best and strongest pictures are those that I think most strongly reflect who you are. I'm a guy who, who really is into trying to live life in a full way. Um, I, I had spent a number of years ago time, kind of long story, but spending time with people who were um, wrestling with cancer. And through that experience of, of them, you know, some of them dying, taught me a lot about life. And, and that it's kind of catapulted me further into just how do you get more out of life. Mark, as far as photographer, Mark Rabu, I think says it best, photography is savoring life one one hundredth of a second. So it's somehow you get more. And so the trick is I think I'm someone who's trying to do that, whether it's in post-production or teaching or um, being a dad and I love my girls and my mm -hmm. wife and, and, and bringing all these together. How do I, how do I do something that, that furthers kind of that passion for life. So I think if I'm anything, I'm kind of, I mean, a lot of teachers are this, they're just people who want to still be students, still learn and grow and collaborate. So I define myself kind of as a creative, as a creative or a creative person that happens to do stuff. I mean, it happens to, to do stuff with cameras right. or um, write, I, I like writing a lot, doing the book thing or teaching tutorials on Photoshop. Road biking, mountain biking, camping, hiking, biking, surfing, kayaking, basically getting right. outside. And volleyball, skateboarding. Volleyball, yeah, all that. And, and it's not that I'm, you know, my goal is to be amazing at anything, but it's to, to get out there. And that then shapes, I think, when you like the outdoors, it shapes how you work in Photoshop. Because I want to be fast and furious so I can get back out there. Right. You know, and I kind of tell my students things like that, that you know, my kids and my passions are my edge. My grandfather I never knew was a sign painter back when billboards were painted by hand. Oh, wow. He could paint with his right and his left hand equally as well. And I've heard all these wonderful stories about him, a creative, interesting man. And then my mom, who's an artist, my dad, who built the home I grew up in, because all of these people, while they didn't necessarily show me photography, they showed me that you can pursue art. And I think that's, that's huge for all of us, right? And that's part of, I think, why this show is so fun. It's just celebrating that people do different kinds of things and are pursuing this and that you can do it. Like it's a valid and viable and amazing way to go. You right. know? So those people, and then how it all came about was, again, I'll make a long story short, was there was a season of my life where I had to use a wheelchair and my walking was really limited. In that time, I got into photography because I figured I could drive around and take pictures because it could make me mobile. And so it was this, this great activity. And I think. It also, you know, that's kind of what you know, these other creative people do is they say, okay, well, here's a situation. Plan A didn't work out, plan B didn't work out, plan C didn't work out. What else can I do? And maybe even, I don't know, I've heard this kind of a saying, but where life's an apple pie, limited number of slices, get one while you can before they're gone. That's person A, person B is the same thing, limited number of slices, get one while you can before they're gone. But if they're gone, make another pie, right. you know, and you just go for it. Right. Um, so that became an outlet for me yeah. and a way to uh, see and notice and stop and pause and uh -huh. all that. So it just started from there, really, and then um, grew into you know, capturing life as it unfolded. Right. Really. Right.
everyone wants to have a style. Where you're like, you see the picture and you're like, I know that's Rodney Smith. And any of his pictures you see, whether in the cover of Time or in Vogue or wherever, you're like, I know that's his. Mm -hmm. And so for them, if you ask a student, um, what kind of style do you want to have? They can't answer the question because it's too big. And so you break, you know, break it down. One class, I said, "Hey, let's try this goofy thing out. Are you guys up for it?" They said, "Okay." And I said, "Well, I want you to describe the style you aspire to by comparing it to food." And all of a sudden, they were into it. One <laughs> student, this guy, um, or I'll start with this gal, Don, who said, "I want my photography to be like a souffle. That it's simple from a distance, but it's kind of layered." It's always full of a little surprise. Uh -huh. and I thought, that's, that's beautiful. Another guy, Otter, he's from Iceland. And uh, he said, he said, once, once a year, New Year's Day, my family would have a spoonful of caviar. We just <laughs> talked about it with like this you know, intensity. He said, I want my photography to be like caviar. Not everyone likes it. But the people who do, they're just committed to it beyond me. <laughs> that, that, that's a beautiful description of style. You're not pleasing everyone, you know. Yeah. And so I think the reason I give that example is where kind of where do you start? Is you start either by making comparisons, or, or, or um, if if the question of style is too big, they'll say, well, what kind of style do you like in regards to magazines? What magazine do you like to look uh -huh. at? Okay, you like. A student will say, I really like Vogue. Well, do you have a subscription to it? No. Get one. Have you ever talked to a Vogue photographer who shot a cover of Vogue? No. Call one up. Go in, you know, intern for him. Yeah. So it's finding these little incremental ways to clarify, yeah. I think, your passions. And anyone will tell you, everyone starts out shooting everything. You know, right. There's like a fire hydrant, a tree, a person, you know, just everything. Uh -huh. And what you eventually have to do is say, out of that, how do I create a cohesive voice? And what what is the thread that connects? Mm -hmm. And that may mean shooting a series of fire hydrant pictures. Mm -hmm. and, and if if you can turn something into a collection or a series, it becomes more valuable. So anyway, all that being said, is I think to find those passions, it's doing some of those smaller exercises mm -hmm. that eventually lead you towards that path. So what we're gonna do today is. I want to get out on the tracks and try to take some photos. My approach is almost going to be a little bit monotonous or normal in the sense I'm just going to try to be persistent and getting a couple perspectives and as far as your role, just being who you are. So Chris has taken us back in time. Check this baby out. What is it? <laughs> yeah, so, so this is a um, large format camera and it's made of wood and brass. Um, one of the reasons I like it um, is that it, again, it, I don't know, it helps you, it helps you slow down a little bit and, um, you know, sometimes I'll photograph someone and I'm lucky if I get to create or make two pictures. Yeah. And then, you know, with the digital capture, um, that would might be 200 or something. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and the film is all expired and really difficult to get, so that means the type of film I'm using. Um, that uh, you never know if the picture will really even turn out. So you have the film is so old. Yeah. So you have to deal with the wood. It's upside down. Yeah. And the film that's expired. Yeah. So there's so many different challenges. So what are you going to be doing today? We're on a yeah. crazy train trestle. Yeah. So Jeff, um, which is great, he's here. I've been wanting to photograph him for a while. We were joking about it earlier that the last time I, I set up, we set up to meet. I brought my other cameras and I forgot this one. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> You kind of need a camera to take pictures. Yeah, so here we are at round two, which, yeah. which I'm excited to get to do this in. So what's crazy too is that the train is live. Like yeah. it could come any minute. So do you want me to grab a camera if we hear a train? I'll grab the camera. Okay, but then, um, but you yeah, don't we... trust me, do you? <laughs> yeah, I might I fall. <laughs> right, right, yeah, I know. So, but you wanted to come early morning because there's the fog. Like tell us about your lighting situation and kind of yeah. what you're gonna do. Yeah, that's a good good point. I, I um, it's kind of funny. I'm pretty simple when it comes to photography. I usually don't have someone assist me, and I use all natural and available light almost, you know, 100% of the time. And so for something like this, if there's fog or weather, it's great. And I was hoping for more fog yesterday. It was really really foggy yeah. and misty. Um, 
but for outdoor natural light stuff, this is just like a giant, I'm gonna translate it to for studio photographers, it's like a giant soft box. And right. so it's a really soft type of light. And then Jeff, we, we look, yeah, right there, that was cool. Um, yeah, and then you just kind of hold that spot. This thing basically um, is going to be to see how see how we're doing. And Jeff, if you wouldn't mind standing there, then uh, if this turns out bad, I'll probably keep it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know? exactly. Let's see what's in here. So then, um, yeah, yeah. So tell us what, how you set up your fancy camera here. Yeah, so it's pretty simple. Just um, it, it literally is a, is a box. And uh -huh. so um, it, it's a box with bellows. And then there's some adjustments that you can make to change the, what's in focus or what's out of focus. So how you change the focus is right here? Or is that the... It is the the distance of the lens to the the film uh -huh. changes the focus, but then also the angle. And so this is kind of a little tilt shift right here. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that cool. is how you do tilt shift sure. stuff. Um, the tilt is yeah, I can't really do it because my hands are full. But right, right here, here, then the shift is down below. Um, do you trust me? <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's, it's okay. fine. Um, and. So if we, if we tilt this, we could, in that last picture, you kind of saw that his eyes were in focus, but his feet weren't. Right. So I was able to create that tilt. And then um, I can shift it a couple of different ways, even just subtly in here, you could have the focus falling. Wow. Uh, one way or another. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, so I mean, the beauty of it is really simple. Um, and I have two daughters, uh, they're about, uh, four and a half and six and a half and they'll yeah. use this camera because really? there isn't a lot to it you just push the button and it's exciting and to here's see. your shutter or yeah, and your here's your shutter and that's wow. it you know so it's really really simple so with digital cameras now we focus on ISO yeah. and shutter speed and f-stop how do you control all that here yeah so that so the the f-stop I'm setting here I'm shooting at five six uh -huh. the fifteenth of a second with this ring um, and then the ISO is, is based on the film I'm using. And that last one, I'm not sure if it was because of my exposure or because of what happened, but right. it was underexposed. And with the negative, you want to err on the side of overexposure. Uh -huh. So. Cool. So you were a guide in South Africa. Tell us about that. What, what does a guide mean? What were you doing? Um, I was working at a, at a private game reserve. So yeah. it's got all of the, the big five. So your lion, leopard, rhinoceros, elephant, buffalo, and um, it's in an area of South Africa which is it's situated right next to the Kruger National Park. I, I wanted to study internationally and I wanted to go to, uh, you know, one of the best places to do it. And uh, I you know, did a lot of research and, and uh, yeah, Brooks really stood out. And plus yeah. I had a, um, quite a few friends uh, here in California that I had met through working at Mala Mala back in South Africa. Really? And Chris is a professor there. So Chris, how were uh, you how were you chosen to come on, on this shoot with him? Since you're wildlife, why did he have you come and assist? Is it because your cool accent? Uh, <laughs> it sound good on camera? Yeah, that's probably the only reason why. <laughs> <laughs> Chris came and found me in the labs one day and offered me a job. So really? I was uh, I, I wasn't going to say no, you know, sure. because um, I, I really had, admire his style of photography, the way he works with people. Really? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to, to working with him. Sure. I enjoy working with him, and uh, yeah, it's been great. <laughs> Chris is, um, I think, I would have to say he's highly respected by all of the students. Um, mm -hmm. He is definitely uh, one of the favorite instructors. Really? Um, he he okay. creates a very... Uh, dynamic exciting uh, class really? I, I you know I've only dealt with them on a one-to-one -one basis but everybody sure. that I've spoken to has said that his classes are different because they're very personal um, huh. and his uh, his style of photography is is very personal mm -hmm. um, and just the way he deals with people and um, 
yeah, just the way he, you know, he, he teaches it as well. Mm -hmm. um, he brings a certain energy and uh, inspires you to, to think of it in a different way or look at it in a different way. Cool. So what, do you, what have you been doing today? Um, my, my job today is uh, just to, to make sure that you know, Chris can, can do things smoothly and not yeah. have to worry about um, loading film and, and all of those sorts of things. Because there's so many and moving pieces that... Yeah, definitely. Uh, when you, I mean, he wants to form a connection with the person he's photographing and he, he wants that to flow smoothly so he doesn't, you know, as a photographer, you don't want to have to you know, spend time um, sort of loading film and, and, and doing right. those sorts of things because they interrupt the flow that you know, he was speaking about earlier. Right. So for me, it's just to make sure that he's got everything that he needs uh, when he needs it. So have you worked with Chris before? Has he ever taken photos of you? Yeah, the, the second time he came over, he took a bunch of photographs with his uh, medium format, Hasselblad, and his digital camera. Yeah. He does great work. He's, so is he kind of a big deal in the photography world? I think he is. Yeah? Mostly his inspiration, you know, not yeah. only with his photographs, but with his personality. When you, yeah. I love hanging out with him because you, you just feel really inspired to go make some really cool photographs. Yeah. And, and, uh, and he's really good at what he does and, mm -hmm. and su super fun to work with because uh, I think it's fun when photographers shoot photographers because you both kind of have an idea of what's sure. going on, you know. And, yeah. and I, he, I like the way he works. It's kind of how I would like to work or how I work is just kind of um, you have an idea, you try to go for it, but you just shoot whatever happens and right. just kind of roll with it, you know, and right. that's when you get the good photos. Yeah, I'm switching it up a little bit. Um, one, just the square, this is a square format camera, mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting. I think the square format's kind of like the minor scale or a minor chord versus the rectangle's more of like the major, you know, it's more, oh, yeah. um, you know, you can, you can, it's a little bit more offbeat. Uh, or, or, and if you do it right, it can be interesting. And so, so this is a Hasselblad, and it's, I mean, how old is that camera? Um, this one isn't that, it's not that old, but it is a film camera. Uh -huh. And um, w one of the things I'm trying to do here, I take a couple shots of, um, that are out of focus, where the tracks behind Jeff are in focus and he's out. Um, and one of my colleagues at Brooks, is, he's a great photographer, he's shot for National Geographic and all these places, but he does travel stuff and he always says, you know, the first day get the obvious shot, the second day do the work of a photographer. Wow. And he says if you have 10 minutes, you know, the first minute shoot the obvious Golden Gate Bridge shot, the next nine minutes do the work of a photographer. So for me, as someone who does portraits, I'm trying to do that too, where I'm getting shots that are kind of strong and show Jeff, but then are also um, not quite so obvious, you know, so maybe that means focus or composition or something different. So and is so that why you call it the minor chord? I do, yeah, okay. yeah. So kind of thinking more like jazz or sure. something where it's like the major, major chord is dun 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 dun, it's big and bold and you see it, you like it right away. Yeah. The minor kind of grows on you um, sure. with time and so I'm, you know, I think photography the deal is that you never know what you're going to get mm -hmm. and you're trying to um, respond to what's happening and one of the ways to do that is to look through different cameras or to um, just kind of shoot different things and give yourself the freedom to maybe mess up. Right. Um, so if you're a musician, like, you know, that I, like, I want to create some bad photographs here today so that I can get those out of my system, whether that means they're too obvious right. or it means they're just not dynamic, you know, right. um, so. And you can learn and grow from that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, okay, we have the uh, layer blending here that we rub this image on the train tracks. So we have a little wood texture. We use soft light blend mode for that. And then we have the uh, rust at a low opacity. No, that was actually a high opacity. This one, I mean like two doubling it up. Oh, I punched, punctured the image, which is kind of cool. You could buy a plug-in to do that, but um, this one is just the real deal. And then, uh, 
image punch? Is that the button? Yeah, it's called the image punch button. And um, just makes for some photographic fun. And it's trash to most people, but I think that's what makes it beautiful. I think a camera really does help um, lengthen life. Yeah. Literally, it pauses moments. I think things that you would have otherwise forgotten. You, you capture and, and um, I think almost memories and moments are magnified and so uh, that's obviously all shaped through my life experience. Yeah. I think that's what's fun about photography is we all have these different life experiences. Like other people I teach with, you know, one guy, say Ralph Clevenger, who he has a marine biology background, he brings that to his nature photography. Right. Or, or maybe another guy, Rich Fuller, he he used to jump out of airplanes all the time and he's done a ton of aerial photography and he combines those and so it's to me what's interesting especially with students too is not how do you cut yourself off from your passion you I think we will dry up if we do that right and, and it, passions could be things that have happened positive or negative but how do we kind of bring those things right. together and figuring out what your passion is and going for it I right. mean, that's really I mean, if there is a recipe I think that's it um, one of the questions I am always asking myself, and my students are always asking me, is how do we make better pictures? How do we become better photographers, right? That's our pursuit, that's what makes photography interesting. I mean, if, if we could get it, we wouldn't keep doing it. We're always kind of out there searching for that. And I think a lot of it boils down to this. Um, at graduation review at Brooks, Jay Mizell was reviewing a student's portfolio. Jay's a phenomenal New York photographer. And he gave a pretty good review. He said the work is decent, which meant a lot to that student. And he said, okay, yeah, it's good, but Jay, how do I take more interesting pictures? And Jay just volleys back without missing a beat. He says, become a more interesting person. And I really think that that is the crux of it. And that if we want to get better photography, yeah, there's technique and all these things, but ultimately it's how do we develop who we are, develop our interests and passions, and then bring those into photography. My name's Jeff Johnson. I'm a injured surfer, climber, rider, photographer, and uh, I've just been framed. How's it, everyone? My name's Sean Walton. I'm a wildlife photographer from South Africa. I'm currently a student at the Brooks Photography Institute, and I've just been framed. My name is Chris Horry. I'm a photographer and teacher, and I've just been framed. I don't know if that was... Um, Boom! So. <laughs> Chris, there is no wonder that your students absolutely love you. So, for those of you that want to learn a few post-processing tricks from the man himself, don't go anywhere. Professor Orwig is going to teach us right now. If not, we'll see you next week. So one of the things I'm, I'm passionate about it, is post-production. Yeah. You know, I, I think photography is you know, everything from maybe looking at images and photo books to creating the images and the prints and or the post production everything kind of that whole mix and so post production to me is another part of it that I'm really passionate about is you know how do you get good at Photoshop I think the best way is to teach someone yeah. I tell my students this all the time find a roommate or neighbor or someone who's really bad at Photoshop and teach them that and it's that same same thing that happens say if, if I were to teach you how to go to the ice cream shop in my hometown because right now I know how to get there but if I had to tell you I would have to look it up and it would reinforce the knowledge right you know, I don't know the street names because I grew up in that town I just sure. to go by the oak tree turn left it's right there um, and so the formalization of teaching or vocalizing something helps people immensely uh -huh. you know and so for me I stay sharp mm -hmm. by teaching and I think that's something other people can do as well because what happens to most people is they kind of do Photoshop like this and they mm -hmm. know their one little path and their mm -hmm. one little way and that's all they know but it's to try to get out of that and and that's what you try to do with the teacher to help yeah. people people see the whole picture and yeah. right and to even do things they're not comfortable with in other words um, let's just say creating a composite a realistic composite mm -hmm. um, one of my students said this funny one where this guy was like weightlifting and it was a piece of broccoli, you know, so it's this kind of <laughs> silly thing. But um, even if he doesn't want to do that kind of photography, 
by doing a composite, it teaches you skills which you then can apply to nature photography sure. or can apply to people photography. Because it's how do I work with light, texture, color, tone, perspective? And so I think part of Photoshop too is kind of going through exercises, like we do as photographers, going through these different exercises which teach us little things which we can then kind of stitch together to develop our own style and right. voice. Right. So if someone ever comes to me, and so far no one's done this yet, but if they ever come to me and say, gosh, Chris, you know, I saw your photograph, you are so good at Photoshop. Uh, like I feel like that, you know. That's the time when I say, "Okay, reality check. I've crossed the line. I've gone too far." You know, it's it's become about something that isn't, and so I, I think that, that that is really the goal that. is is to is to do that. And the trick with Photoshop, I think, is that we convince ourselves something's good. Here's what happens. So at Brooks here, we have grad review, which is a special time. Students come with their best work. Here's my defense for why I should graduate. Mm -hmm. know, and some of them don't pass. So a lot of the retouching portfolios aren't good. And I'll flip through them, I'll say, hey, here's a before, here's an after. The before is better than the after, and can you kind of see why? And, and, and I kind of say, yeah, and I say, well, what happened? And they say, I don't know, but I spent eight hours on that file. And they say, yeah, but this is, this is you know, better, and that's worse. Yeah, but it was eight hours. And they keep going back to how long it took them. So it's almost as if, the amount of effort expended equals quality, you know, and, and that's kind of how we convince ourselves. Like I've done this so long, or, or you work on a photo so much, you kind of get used to the fact that it's overdone. And so that's where I think we need that reality check: close your eyes and look back, or ask a friend, "Is this right. good?" Or because again, the point is, um, do these things support the image? Another friend of mine who took a cooking class said it this way: He said, "I'm, I'm learning how to cook." And, the, and our instructor said, we need to use spices and seasoning in a way that no one can identify what you put in. I thought, that's totally Photoshop, right? You know, it's accenting something. But if you ever eat something that has too much, let's say, salt or oregano or something, it's like, you're like, wow, like first bite, maybe second bite, can't do it. It's right. too much. And so, again, that's a challenge. How do we, as artists, as photographers, as creatives, use this tool? but do it in a way that is an accent, not overpowering. Uh -huh. So when working on photographs, there's these kind of different worlds. One is like, am I going for objective realism, um, which really doesn't exist, but, or how subjective am I going? Is this, you know, is this more just something of an illustration? This kind of right. a picture, I just want to go for a feeling, you know, so, so I'm, I'm just going to explore what I can do to do that. And, mm -hmm. and so it's just really subtle controls. And this is most images, you kind of do something like this to start off with. Mm -hmm. Lightroom, I think of as the tool, really, that you do your starting work. Um, I had one friend explain it to me. It's like Lightroom's kind of like your general doctor, and then Photoshop's like the specialist. Specialist, or, Yeah, okay. it's not perfect. So that's analogy. how your workflow is. You go through all of your photos in, in Lightroom. Exactly, okay. yeah. So, so hit it up there, and all that I'm trying to do there is, is figure out, is this image worthwhile? And, and is it almost worthwhile to take it to Photoshop? Mm -hmm. I think one of the big problems, most of my students, and I see a lot of professionals out there, is Lightroom's amazing, non-destructive, quick, but they stop at Lightroom. And, I, and once you get good at Lightroom, you can see images, you're like, oh, they just use Lightroom. So they kind of... Let's say if it's baking, they just bake the cookie eighty percent of the way. You know, it's not all the way finished or, or whatever. You right. Know? Um, and so, I think the finishing is Photoshop. And in Lightroom, press Command E to go to Photoshop, mm -hmm. and then have to go to full screen mode. And a photo like this, really, all that it needs is is um, is, is contrast. And it's not complicated as far as contrast, but it just would be a curves adjustment or something like that. And, and maybe little bragging of the whites and, and, and uh, um, darkening the blacks. And the reason I wanted to show this image is because that's kind of like the easiest processing in the world. You know, we did, you know, contrast and a little color and a little curve um, mm -hmm. and I might do some sharpening too, but it makes for a pretty vivid, vivid picture. And I think that um, sometimes what happens to a lot of my students is they get so good at Photoshop that they don't allow themselves to make simple adjustments. Right. 
and they're like, oh, I did this, is it okay? It only took me five minutes. And I'm like, yeah, like that's yeah, great. Cool. You know, some images take more time, others don't. So that's uh -huh. kind of an easy one. Okay. And then let me show you a couple other photographs I have open here. And um, you can press Control tab on a map to scroll through your images. This one is a photograph of a cyclist. And it's in a wind tunnel in San Diego. And the original image was this one, kind of editorial, straightforward. Oh, wow. And what I'm trying to do in post-production is say, how do I just clean up stuff? So I remove something, hide the person looking in the window. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you're looking for momentum with your photographs, meaning you do a couple of things and you do easy things first to gain that momentum. And mm -hmm. you rarely start with you know, everything. Um, and I think that kills some images. So, so in this case, um, you kind of see I'm, I'm working more on um, after cleaning up, just some uh, kind of blur and then some different color toning and then work on some more of the details. And at every step of the process, I'm always asking myself, is this worthwhile and am I willing to let go of what I've done? Meaning, although it maybe it take 10 minutes, am I able to go back to, say, the original photograph? And so you're kind of, you're kind of constantly asking yourself those questions. And then cool. um, looking at how you can make these changes in tones. Um, in this case, you kind of see it becoming a little more subtle and also working a little bit more with light near the end and then pulling out a lot of that saturation. What happens with color is that we love it, you know, kind of like kids love candy. Mm -hmm. I have two daughters and they, if you give them a bag of, you know, some kind of candy, they'll have as much as they want and then oh, have a stomachache. Mm -hmm. and so, we do that in post-production, so a lot of that means, I think, near the end of our workflow, backing off, you know, just saying, okay, what can I do? Um, and the other thing with color, I think this image, if I were to look at it, I'd say it's pretty colorful, but there really aren't any colors in it. That What happens is the photographs that feel most colorful are those with the fewest colors in them. Right. And so I'm also kind of thinking about that, you know, and, and trying to capture, in this case, speed and this ethereal, more illustration. This isn't realism. This again is expression. Right. So let's check it. This is this guy, really cool guy, um, pro surfer, photographer. Um, he was on the cover of my last book. And um, this is the image. I, and it's interesting to me because you don't know where it is really taken. And right. all that I'm doing in Photoshop is a little curve to bring the image to his face, because that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. And then do a little bit more with the background, bringing that down, and then do a little bit of color and tone to kind of give it this, you know, kind of travel-esque picture. And this mm -hmm. picture is taken a block away from here in Santa Barbara. But it looks like it could be in Mexico or something, so right. I want some of those warm tones. So, and the reason I show this one is just that, again, it's kind of, how do I, actualize my vision or my thought or my emotion and it's not you know what action do I push or what button it's how do I use all these skills and then get somewhere with mm -hmm. them. so that's kind of that's kind of the, the, the scoop I think right. with good Photoshop work this is a different one and I'm going to press tab here to get rid of everything for a moment mm -hmm. and then um, F7 to go pull up the layers panel but this picture was fun because it was on a backcountry ski trip, mm -hmm. and I was just so wiped out because it was such a strenuous trip. And I was in the tent, exhausted, but I came out for the sunset and took this picture. And I wanted to bring the sunset back to how I experienced it. Right. The camera records it this way, so I have good exposure. I don't have anything blown out, detail, my shadows mm -hmm. aren't too dark. And then a lot of it is about um, working on the, on the sky, and, and in this case, I was using, I think, my laptop, so you can kind of see I'm using a track oh, yeah. pad here. And I'm just, you know, probably on the flight home, I don't remember exactly when I did this, I'm just looking to bring dimension. A couple colors start to pop, uh -huh. a few others, that was, I did the pinks, I did the blues, I did some brightness, um, again, creating a little bit of contour, a little more color, and then small little areas of color. Again, looking for these little spots, and cool. what I found makes good for good image making again it's those it's a little details you know and it's not like this is curves and a mask and 
that's kind of it, you know. It's, mm -hmm. But it's that you're you're looking for the details, and then the mountains, um, the same kind of thing where where I'm just trying to bring those forward, and then working on some of the ridges to give a little accent, and then some overall just little color snap. So it kind of goes from this to that, and. Again, it was my experience was I was out in the snow and the sunset it was just the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced. Yeah. And this happens a lot of photography that we, we get back and there's kind of that huge letdown. Right. And this happens to me almost every photo shoot I do. And I have to give myself some time to kind of live with an image or I have to start to work on it and get back to what it was about. And I think that's that's kind of the beauty and wonder of post-production is right. that you can get to those those things. I'll press tab to bring that back up. And I think that's um, beautiful. that was the other image. I have other ones, but I think those are kind of a good um, good little sample of some ideas about post-production. Right. I have a ton of training on Linda.com, you know, 60 or 70 hours on how mm -hmm. to do the little techniques. Mm -hmm. But the challenge always is, for my students, either online or in classroom, is, mm -hmm. is is to learn the techniques, but then to say, how does this apply to me? Right. And, and the challenge is that it's one thing to so portrait photography. Um, and I'm working on a portrait book right now. It's one thing to see someone else take a good portrait, understand it, and identify it. It's another thing to get out there yourself right. with your camera. and and to photograph someone that means something to you. So in portraits, so often we photograph, you know, when our students photograph their roommate or someone they don't really care about. But no, photograph like your grandfather because you admire him. I mean, he's the man you admire most in the world. Photograph him and that little tip you learned in class will mean more. Or in Photoshop, you know, do Photoshop work on that same picture, your grandpa. Right. You know, because it matters. I mean, this picture matters to you, to your family, to your history, to your life. And getting good at Photoshop, I think, is a, is a lot about working on images that mean something to you, not stock photos, not someone else's photos. I mean, right. that's all important. You kind of tinker, but then after the tinkering, you make it your own. Right. A technique that's essential for everyone it's really helpful is to figure out how to make adjustments in particular areas of your pictures. This is a photograph of this guy, Timmy Curran, a professional surfer, really talented surfer. And I'll bring it into Photoshop. And really what I want to look at is, um, let's say that what I need to do is separate the guy from the background a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I like train tracks a lot, obviously, as we've discovered. And right. this happens to be another one of those train track images. And so to do that, in this case, I'm going to grab um, a quick selection tool and just make a selection around the guide. I'm not even going to worry too much about the selection. Um, and I'm painting either away the selection or painting it in. And the point here isn't really quick select because you could use any of your selection tools to do this, but it's going to be more getting into masking. And if there's anything that, say, one of my students needs to graduate with, I mean, like, they have to be really good at it's uh, masking and masking I think really is the uh, it's the essential um, the essential technique uh, as far as layer masking that allows you to either sharpen your images selectively or make color adjustments or detail adjustments or whatever it is in this case we're not going to make really an amazing adjustment but um, sorry about that but we're going to um, do something that I think will be visual to kind of illustrate the concept. And go here. Uh -oh. And let's just see what we got happening. Just wrap up this little selection. So quick select is infamous for making quick but a little bit rough selections. Mm -hmm. So with this tool, the next step is going to be to go to Refine Edge. And Refine Edge will show us the image. And if we look at it up close, particular with the hair, there's a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Using Smart Radius to um, clean those up will, will give us a little bit more transition. And then some of the tools which allow us to tell Photoshop to, to either pay more attention to these areas of the picture, in other words, build up a better edge. And so we go through and kind of build up our edge or, or kind of clean up the edge the other way around, depending on how we needed to do that. 
And once you have an edge in there, and I'm not going to spend time making it perfect. It's more mm -hmm. of a concept. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to just keep this as a selection and, and click OK, and then make an adjustment. Wow. And so in this case, the adjustment is going to be a saturation adjustment, removing color from the guy. I'll, you know, I'll invert it just to kind of give us a sense of what's happening here. And, it, and again, it's more the illustration than it is that this is something you want to do to your right. pictures. Wow. But in this case, there's a problem that which will be hard to see, but that there's color down below, so I can kind of fix that, either painting um, with my mask down here, or there might be a color up there. And once you have a good mask, you can repurpose it. So this is where I'm getting to kind of the masking tip. So far, a selection of masks, kind of normal. Mm -hmm. The next thing I would say is option clicking the mask to, to look at if you have any problems with it. Um, that's really helpful. And then reuse it. So mm -hmm. a way we could reuse it is make another adjustment. Hit up curves adjustment. In this case, it's a darkening adjustment. And then I want to copy my mask from one layer to another. And to do that, you hold down Option or Alt and click and drag. And this will then bring that layer mask over. So now I have an adjustment which controls the background. And I could create that separation, either brightening the background or darkening it. And I could do that, maybe create another adjustment, say for the guy. Curves and now he totally pops. That is crazy. Yeah, and again, option clicking. Right. And then, um, in this case, inverting it so that I have this, you know, even a little bit more. And so it's these other two adjustments which have changed the thrust of the focus. It's now a little bit more about the guy. Right. My example is a little bit over exaggerated. Sure. My edges aren't perfect. But there's the concept which is this layer mask allows me to focus in on one area. It may be. What I really want to do is sharpen the guy, not the background. Uh -huh. Use the layer mask. It's not going to be a, this black and white thing, you know, if ever. Uh -huh. But it's more of that selectively modifying right. certain parts of your images. So if there's one thing to get good at, the thing I would throw in, in the hat would be masking and layer masking. Yeah. You know, that helps out a ton. That was cool. I liked that. I think that's awesome.